There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. So with that in mind, let's open the scriptures together, shall we? We're going to turn our attention tonight and tomorrow night to a chapter in 1 Corinthians. Would you find 1 Corinthians in your Bible? If you were here on the Lord's Day, you say he's going backwards, something's wrong. We spent all day Sunday in 2 Corinthians, chapter number 8. I hope you'll go back and spend some time again reading, praying through that great chapter and all the principles that we learned there. But I want to draw your attention, if I may, tonight and tomorrow evening, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Now, arguably, it has in it, I think, one of the most famous verses in the Bible on stewardship, and it's the first verse and the second verse, and yet the whole chapter is about stewardship. In fact, verse 1 and verse 2 just kind of get you in the water. It introduces the idea, and then the verses that follow it develop upon that. Now, before we read, you do know chapter and verse divisions are not inspired, right? A meaning that when God gave his word, he did not give it with chapter and verse division. Paul didn't write chapter whatever, verse whatever. Uh, for the record, I'm glad we have it or we'd all still be looking yesterday for 2 Corinthians chapter 8, right? So it's a great tool for study and for finding things in the word of God. But sometimes you have to read through a chapter division to get the full impact of what is being said. So we're going to study together the next two nights, 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, but if you'll permit me, I want to back up into the closing verses of chapter 3. And I'm going to read them, and then I'm going to read straight through into chapter number 4 so that you'll get the context of the text. Every scripture has a setting. And it's very important we understand what the Lord's trying to say to us. Now let's begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Would you read verse 2 aloud with me, church? Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, you may want well to take your pen tonight and mark in verse 1 the word stewards, and in verse 2 the word stewards, because this is really what we're talking about. And uh, what I'm going to give you tonight and tomorrow night is a list. And it's not my list, it's God's list. Uh, it all comes straight from Scripture, but I'm going to give you what the Bible says about stewardship from this portion of Scripture and make application to every one of them. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to do two things. Number one, be here tomorrow night. If you're going to miss any service, miss tonight, but don't miss tomorrow night. It's all right? So... Uh, don't miss the rest of the story. I want you to get the whole thing and all the parts make the whole. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do right now is take out something to write with and something to write on. Would you do that, please? Because I want you to make the list tonight. And gentlemen, that means all of us too. I see, uh, you know, husbands always nudge their wife and say, you take notes for both of us. But she's not your secretary tonight, all right? I want you to take your own list because I'm going to ask you to go back on your own time and meditate on these truths and use it as a spiritual checklist, if you will, on the stewardship of your life. 
If you didn't get this on Sunday, I'm not talking to you about the stewardship of money this week. I'm talking to you about the stewardship of your whole life. Abraham Kuyper said, I love this, he said, there is not a square inch, not a square inch of man's domain over which Christ does not plant his flag and cry, mine. I love that. We are his by creation. We are his by redemption. We are his by provision. In, everything, in other words, everything you have, everything you are, and everything you can do is not because of you. It's all because of God. And that is why the closing verses of chapter 3 are so important. Would you look at them with me for just a moment? He begins in verse 21 by saying, let no man glory in men. Why should we not glory in men? Because everything you have, God gave you. So all the glory goes to Jesus. Would you mark this phrase in your Bible in verse 21? All things are yours. And at the end of verse 22, mark it again. All are yours. In fact, you might want to write in the margin of your Bible a little reference, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 15. He says, all things are for your sakes. This is a repeated emphasis of the Apostle Paul. Everything you have, everything God allows into your life is by divine appointment, divine providence. Uh, look, friends, Christians don't live by accident and coincidence and that happenstance. No, no, no. We live by the mighty providence of our all-wise God. People used to say the devil's in the details. That's ridiculous. God is in the details for a life that's following Jesus. And so all these things are yours. Now look at, look at verse 22, sandwiched between the, the two phrases. You see the book ends, all things are yours, and then all are yours. Sandwiched between. Look what he lists here. First, he lists your teachers. You got Paul, you got Apollos, and you got Cephas. That's Simon Peter. Arguably, these were the three most famous Bible teachers in the first century church. If somebody said, tell me who the famous preachers are. Tell me who you'd like to go listen to. Somebody's going to say, oh, I'd like to hear Paul. I'd like to hear Paulus because he's quite an orator. And I'd really like to hear Simon Peter, Cephas. These, these are the three teachers. I love the humility that the Spirit of God reveals in the heart of the Apostle Paul here. He says, do you understand that those men are just men and that everything they have and everything they say, all that comes from God? They're just the Lord's servants. That's all they are. You know, I, I hate this, but in, in the Catholic tradition, people talk a lot about the clergy and, and the priesthood and all that kind of thing. Some of that seeps in even to our thinking, and people start thinking of men higher than they ought to think of men. Let me just remind you that the men who stand behind a pulpit like this and preach the Bible are still just black-hearted, hell-deserving sinners in desperate need of the mercy of Jesus Christ. And do you know why they're given? As gifts to the church. They're given because all things are yours. And then look at the list again. He goes on, he says, or the world. What's that encompass? Everything that God's given us to enjoy. The whole created world. Not worldly pleasures, but the world God created. That's all yours. How about life? Are you breathing? Praise God for it. You may not feel as good as you wish you felt, but you're alive, aren't you? That's yours. That's God's gift to you. Every day, God's gift to you. Somebody says, hold on now, preacher. I like the world and life and the teachers, but death, death is God's gift. Don't miss this, please. He's talking to living people. And you know what he's saying? He's saying even the pondering of eternal realities, that's God's gift to you. Spurgeon said, you want to make the most of your life? Meditate on your death. In other words, it's not more of it. Go all the way to the end and think about how you'd like to finish. He says, I want you to know for the child of God, even the thought of death is God's gift to you. Because he reminds you, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. And for the child of God, to die is gain, Paul said. So how bad can it be? The worst thing that happens to you is you die and go straight into the presence of God forever. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know you can't beat being a Christian. He comes to live in your heart now, and you get to go live in his house for eternity. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. All for your sakes. And then look at the list again. He says things present. Some of you right now are dealing with something staring you in the face. And you think, if I can just get through this, if I can just get over this, if I can just get around this, if I can just work this out, don't miss this. Whatever you're dealing with in the present, God is using in your life in some way. And aren't you glad our God's a present tense God? His name is I Am. He's a very present help in time of trouble, and that's yours. And then he says, 
things to come. That means the unknown, the things just over the horizon, around the next bend, not just your current circumstances, but future things. All those things, God says, they're God's gift to you. God's using them in your life. All things work together for good to them that love God and them that are called according to his purpose. All things are yours. Let us go back upstream a little more, please. Follow it to the fountainhead. Look at verse 23. If all those things are yours, who do you belong to? You belong to Christ. You belong to Jesus. He bought and paid for you. He planted his flag on your soul and cried, Mine, you're his child. Oh, this is beautiful. Keep going. If all these things God gave to you, they're all yours, and you belong to Christ, look at the last three words of verse number 23, and Christ is God's. Do you see how all of life brings you back to God? Get in the stream, wherever you're in the stream right now. Maybe you say, I'm not in the stream, preacher. I'm in the white water right now. I'm, I'm riding the rapids. That's all right. Wherever you are, follow that back up stream and you come to the fountainhead. What is the fountainhead of it all? It all brings you back to God. And it is in that setting that we come to chapter 4 where it begins immediately to say, in light of all that, let's do a little accounting. You see the accounting word here. Mark it in your Bible. Let a man so account of us. That's interesting, isn't it? A little play on words, I think, because when you think about stewardship, you typically think about counting money. Isn't that right? Bills and budgets and uh, the tithes, the offerings, the sacrificial gifts. So, all right, we're going to do some counting. Let me just stop right here and tell you something. God has his own economy, and it does not fit in ours. I don't know. I have no earthly idea what Wall Street's going to do. Only Jesus knows what Wall Street's going to do. I don't know what world market's going to do, world leaders are going to do. I have no earthly idea. But I'm going to tell you, as a child of God, I'm not nervous about it. Somebody said, are you nervous about the coming recession? Are you nervous about what's going on? No, I'm not nervous about it. I might not like some of it, and every now and then I might even fuss a little bit about gas prices or whatever else. But here's what I know. I know I'm a child of God, and the Heavenly Father always takes real good care of his children. I'm not going down, friends. I'm going up. I know this, I am in God's hands, and those are very good hands to be in. Eight years ago, when God led Tammy and I to step out into evangelism, it was, it was honestly one of the most frightening times of our life because it was the biggest step of faith we'd ever had to take. As, as adults with family and children, We'd been very comfortable, been there 20 years serving, and we were well cared for and, and you know, every possible way. And when, when I left there and went out into evangelism, honestly, I didn't know where we we're going to preach and what the meeting is going to look like and how we're going to be cared for and all that kind of thing. I wish you had time to, to just tell you some of what the Lord did. But I'm going to tell you, in the months that followed that, God proved himself to us in remarkable ways in ways nobody could ever orchestrate and no one could ever explain. There were times in our home we would open an envelope and read a note from someone we did not know and we would both weep and say, the Lord did this for us. See, there are many channels, but there's only one source. God knows how to get to you whatever he needs to get to you. The problem is not on the Lord's end. The problem is on our end. The problem is never the, in the owner's department. The problem's always in the steward's department. And so the God of heaven, the great owner of it all, is always trying to teach us something about how to steward that which belongs to him anyhow, that which you're going to meet God for someday and answer the Lord for someday. And in this chapter, do you know what he does? He teaches us heaven's accounting principles. Now, we're going to the, we're going to the accounting office. Are there any CPAs in here tonight? I'm just curious. Anybody? and work in that field. I thank God for them. I'm not going to pick on them if you're nervous about raising your hand right now, but uh, well, I have people that help us with things, and I'm grateful for them. I am not a mathematician. That is not my strong suit. So I depend on other people and folks that understand business to advise and certain things and help us and taxes and all of that, and everybody needs a little help in that department. But tonight and tomorrow night, I'm going to teach you some higher math. Is that all right if I teach you some higher math? 
And when I say higher math, I mean real high, like way above the way man thinks. Because what I'm about to show you are God's stewardship principles. This is the way God accounts for our lives. And if it's the way God accounts for our life, don't you think maybe we ought to account the same way? So let's start right here where he does in verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Number one, you ready for the list? Number one, write it down. Here's heaven's accounting principles. Number one, we are stewards of the greatest thing in the world. If I said to you, what is the greatest thing in the world you could steward? It is not money. It is not gold. It is not land. It is not real estate. A thousand times no. Those things are all going to burn up someday. They're all... They're all going to come to naught someday. I got a, a phone call today, and I missed it, and guy left a voicemail, and he obviously had the wrong number. He was calling about some property I had for sale. That's what he was calling about. And I laughed to myself, and I thought, I don't have any property for sale. And the reality is we, we think so much of life in the terms of the physical, the tangible, the, the material, what I can put my hands on. But I want to tell you, that the greatest treasures are not those things. They are the things that money cannot buy. What are they? Well, let's use the Bible term here. Look at it. End of verse number one. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, we've already established that all things are given to us by God. That means we're stewards of all things. So you're a steward of your body. You're a steward of your health as far as you can control it. You're, you're a steward of your family, mamas, daddies. All you mamas and daddies, hear me just a minute. You're a steward of your family. That's very important. You're a steward of opportunity. You're a steward of your mind, what goes in the eye gate, in the ear gate. You're a steward of, of your spirit, your heart attitude. You're a steward of your resources. You're a steward of everything. But don't miss the emphasis of verse number one because usually we miss this. We, we jump straight to verse two. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And then we talk about being faithful in material things. That is not the context of the chapter. Look at verse number one. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Can I tell you the greatest thing you're a steward of? Look up here just a minute. You're a steward of this. You are a steward of the revealed truth of the word of the living God. Do you understand these are things the angels would like to look into? Do you understand these are things the Old Testament saints just looked forward to and with a little puzzled amazement that there had to be more they didn't fully understand? That's why he uses the word mysteries. Look, how many of you like a good mystery? Anybody like a good mystery? Well, usually when we say mystery, the mystery means it's something unknowable. When, when the Bible says the mysteries of God, it doesn't mean it's unknowable. It means there was a time it was unknown, but it has now been revealed to us. And I just want to pause and say, praise God, we live in the most glorious time in the history of the world. They, they took a survey on college campuses and asked them, if you could live any time in history, when would you like to live? Top three answers were the old Wild West, the Victorian era of England, and the roaring 20s in America. Can you imagine? And don't get me wrong, I'd like to visit all of them for maybe a day or two, but I don't want to live in those time periods. I'm going to tell you what I think. I think we are privileged to live in the greatest time in the history of the world. Somebody said, have you watched the news lately? Oh, yeah, but I, look, I'm not looking. Please don't miss this. you got to look at the news not through the lens of politics. you got to look at the news through the lens of prophecy and understand we're living on the verge of the coming of the Son of God. Do you understand, church, somebody's going to be alive and serving Jesus when the trumpet sounds, and we may have been chosen to be on the welcoming committee for the Son of God. Only one person I've ever heard say they'd rather die than be raptured. That was Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon said he'd rather go by way of death. And I thought, what on earth? And I kept reading, and he said, because I'd like to feel what resurrection power feels like coursing through my body. You know what I think? I think whether you are alive or dead, you're going to feel resurrection power go through your body. But the reality is we're living in glorious days. We're part of the church age. We're, this is the age of the Spirit. We are a part of the bride of Christ. And you know what I think? I think we better back up and remind ourselves we're stewards of that truth. 
You know, Pastor, we were talking about this the other day, and I like the emphasis on stewardship of time, right? Stewardship of talent, stewardship of truth. I'd like to add a fourth one to that. We're, we're, excuse me, time, talent, and treasure, right? I'd like to add a fourth one to that, truth. We're stewards of truth. Do you understand that beyond your time, beyond your talent, and beyond your treasure, actually the most long-lasting thing you have is the truth that God has given you? Do you understand truth is the only thing you can actually pass down to your children? Somebody said, no, I can leave them money. Oh, you can leave them money, but they'll spend it up or they'll pass it on or they'll lose it or somebody will rob them of it. But the one thing you can leave your kids and give to the next generation that is, is priceless and precious is the everlasting truth of the Word of God. We're stewards of it. So if that is God's revelation to us, may I just ask you, how are you doing with your stewardship of truth right now? Are your children getting it? How about your grandchildren? I'm in that category now. And I'm starting to think differently even about that. I had Presley the other day. They were in for a couple of days, and the girls needed to run out for something. And I told Tammy and Morgan, I said, I'll keep the baby. And they gave me that look like, are you serious? And I, yeah. It's, it's strange how things change from when you're a dad to when you're a papa. You know, and it's just different. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll keep the baby. I'll take care of the baby. And so Presley and I, sat out on the front porch of our house there in the hills and and I was just looking at her and talking with her and playing with her and admiring her. And before I realized it, I wasn't talking to her. I was talking to the Lord. And I looked at her and I thought, look at that little soul. That's an eternal soul. It's powerful. That, that little one a thousand years from tonight will be somewhere. And you know what I want? I'd like to help put some truth in her. Some of you think, well, my kids are grown. Maybe grandkids are grown. Well, there's some young people around this church that need the truth of the word of God. Why don't you find some young believer in porn? Those people got saved Sunday. Adopt them. Who's going to adopt them? Must we assign them? Or could they be adopted? Could someone say, I'll take that man. I'll take that woman. I'll, I'll, I'll take the truth that's been poured into me and be a vessel through which God can pour it into somebody else. Do, do you understand that this is a relay for race, friend? We, we've been handed the baton, but we're not just supposed to carry the baton. We're supposed to pass it on. Don't drop the baton. What you receive, you must relay to the generation following. The only thing that passes from one generation to another is truth. Truth endureth to every generation. We had this conversation today. I think it is a satanic strategy to disconnect the old generation and the new generation. It's satanic. Look, watch this now. You get, excuse me, I, I say it reverently, you get old people so aggravated with young people they won't talk to them. And then you get young people so annoyed with old people they won't listen to them. And you know what just happened? We just dead-ended the Christian faith. This is a vibrant church, a wonderful church, but if Jesus tarries his coming, what kind of church will be here 50 years from now? 50 years from now, most of us are going to be in glory. How many of you would like there to still be a gospel preaching lighthouse here that your grandkids and great-grandkids could still learn the word of God? How many of you would vote for that? Yes, that's on us. They don't choose that then. We choose that now. We are stewards of the truth. The greatest thing you have is the truth of the word of God, and we must pass it on. Let's get a second principle while we're in verse 1. Look at it, please. Would you mark two things? The Bible says that a man shall account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards. Did you ever notice that stewards and ministers are connected? I want you to write down, this is one of God's great accounting principles, that stewardship and ministry always go together. You say, what's the difference? Why not use the same word? There's a reason. They're different words. They mean different things. They make you think of different things. Stewards is a reminder of our responsibility to God. It makes you look up first. That's where it must start. God gave me this. God entrusted me with this. It's a charge to keep. This is my responsibility to God. But ministers is my responsibility to man. You know what a minister is? A minister is one that is the servant of the Lord, 
serving the Lord on the behalf, ministering to other people. In other words, God gave you what he gave you, not for you to enjoy it, but for you to use it for his purposes. Every good thing, if it's, if it's money, if it's uh, some gift uh, that God has given you, some ability, whatever it is that God has put in your hand, he has entrusted to you so that it would be used for the glory of Almighty God. Would you write this down? Gifts are for service and not for show. Every blessing that God puts in our life is not for us to prance around and talk about how great we are and be admired and somebody pat us on the back. No, no, it is not for show. It is for service. In fact, I can prove that to you. Did you know the word ministers here? Though, though the word in our English Bible, minister and ministry, is found many times. Did you know that the word the Apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1, it is the only time in all of Paul's writings he uses this exact word. Now, that's fascinating to me. Because when the Holy Ghost repeats something over and over and over again, that's for emphasis. But when God reserves a word and uses it sparingly, that's also for emphasis. What could the emphasis be? I want you to write down somewhere that the word minister here was literally the word that was used in Paul's day for an under rower. Like on a ship, you got a captain, you got a crew, you got people up on deck working, leading, in charge, managing, and then beneath. Below deck, you had a bunch of slaves. That was the culture. And the slaves, guess what they were? I've been, I've been on one of those old-time ships where you'd go beneath deck and you'd see the place where the slaves, the servants, would sit and they would row. Uh, this is powerful to me. The apostle Paul, somebody says, there's the great apostle Paul said, I'm the bond slave of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, there's the greatest Christian that's ever lived. Paul said, let me tell you who I am. I'm just a servant of Jesus Look, please, we're not in charge of this thing. The Lord's in charge of what he's doing in this world. We're just the under rowers. We're not the captain. He's the captain of our salvation, and we are the servants behind the scene saying, Lord, we just, we're all yours, and whatever you want to do with us, the answer is yes. I wonder, have you come to such a place? Most people think in a stewardship conference that you're going for some, some um, commitment to something, some commitment. We like to use that word. We're going to make a commitment to this, a commitment to that, a commitment to give this. Uh, I'm going to tell you, before you ever get to commitment, you've got to get to surrender. Those are two different things. Watch here. Look up here just a minute. Commitment does this. Surrender does this. Commitment says, this is what I'm going to give. This is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to go. Surrender says, Lord, whatever you want. Lord, I'm all yours. Jesus, my life is yours. All that I have, you gave me. And so I want to be a good steward. And to be a good steward, I must be a good minister. This is not just about me having a nice, happy, comfortable life. This is not just about God's blessing on our four and no more. We want, we want the Lord to bless our family. No, I want God to use me. Do you want God to use you? Are you willing to let God use you? This is heaven's accounting principles, you see. Let's come to a third one. Come to verse 2. Moreover, because of that, it is required. One requirement. What's the requirement in stewards? That a man be found. What's that word, church? Faithful. Number three, would you write this down? Faithfulness is more important than giftedness. I am learning this more and more. Faithfulness is more important than giftedness. You know, sometimes people in the church say, well, I'm just not gifted like other people. I, I can't sing like she can. I, I can't lead like he can. I, I don't have a mind for that. I can't, I can't. Can I tell you something Frank Sells taught me years ago? Old Dr. Sells said this. He said, I can't is just as much pride as I can because both of them start with I. Sometimes in a church, People are spectators and not participants. And the reason that they give is, well, you know, I'm just not very talented. I'm just not very able. I'm just not very gifted. I just want to remind you that even the, the lesser members of the body are essential according to our Lord Jesus, which means the body only functions and is healthy and moves forward when every member of the body finds their place and does their part. And the great thing is not giftedness. For a long, long time I worked in in college work with young adults and many of them who said they wanted to be in the ministry. 
And uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The, the most gifted people are not always the ones who get it done. Matter of fact, I, look, I can stand up here and tell you stories for hours of kids who came through and somebody said, wow, what a voice. Uh, look at the music talent. What a mind. And sharp, talented, gifted, pardon me, never did a blooming thing for the Lord. You don't know why? Because they were leaning on their own giftedness. And then you have that poor boy that comes through and somebody says, I don't know if he's going to make it. I mean, you know, I tell you now, he's struggling in his classes. He's not much of a speaker, is he? But there he is, just plodding on for Jesus. And I've lived long enough now, some of you know what I'm talking about, to realize those were the people that made the difference. You know, we all have gifts, and if you're not careful, you don't know one of those dangerous things, you start relying on your gifts. Can I just remind you, this is a separate study, but you ought to study in the Bible. Uh, the people who had great failures in Scripture did not fail in the areas of their weaknesses. They failed in the areas of their gifts. You ought to study that out sometime. Who was the mo meekest man in the Bible? Tell me, who was the meekest man? Moses. Isn't it funny? He got angry. Hit a rock twice. Meek Moses. And could not enter the promised land. If I had to say who is the one man in the Bible who is passionate for God. Man, you talk about a man after God's own heart. That's David, right? And yet it was his passion that got him in trouble. Interesting, isn't it? That it's not the weak areas where people typically trip up. In fact, the weak areas are the good things for us. They humble us, you don't think. They remind us we're nothing and God's everything. Lord, I don't know what to do, but you have to know what to do. I can't, but you can't. I'm trusting you. The weak areas are good for us because they drive us to the Lord's strength. But in the areas where we think we're strong, if we're not careful, we, we mess up. Do you know why? Because we're leaning on our own gifts. I want to say to you, you better never let the gifts distract you from the giver. And I think far too often that happens. We'll talk more about this later. But we get enamored even by the gifts that God has given us. Start thinking more highly of ourselves. We ought to think more highly of Jesus. That's what we ought to do. And we ought to remember that the one thing God's looking for is faithfulness. Isn't this glorious? This is the one thing all of us can be. Every one of us. My dad is preaching a revival meeting tonight. Dad is 72. 25 years older than me. He pastored the same church for 33 years. Retired just a few months ago. He's been out preaching. And I, I called today just to check on him, and I knew where he was and who he was preaching for, and they were in the car together. And, and we talked and laughed and cut up, and he told me about the meeting and what the Lord is doing. And I'm just going to tell you, my dad is one of my greatest heroes. He's not a perfect man. But my dad, 72 years old, is still happy in Jesus. He's still happy in the Lord. He hadn't lost that. He's in a little transition time in life right now, he and mom, and, and that's, that's, that's tough, you know. Transitions can be difficult, but he's still doing whatever God gives him to do, and he's excited about it. <laughs> you know what my life verse is? Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I've received with the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what I'm praying. I'd like to finish my course with joy. Not the ministry first, my course, my life. I figure if I can get my life, keep my life right, then the ministry will end right, you know. Dad is exemplifying that to me at this season in his journey. My dad was a businessman. He never went to college. Started selling when he was 18 years old and, and did well. Did very well. Worked his way up. Became vice president of a company, and when I was a little boy, I had had good money coming in, and man, we had nice vacations and <laughs> drove nice cars and all that. And when my dad was in his thirties, God called him to preach. In his thirties, and Dad started preaching, and then this church called him, and he's pastored it for thirty-three years. And my dad, now in our area, he's famous. You can't go anywhere that you don't know him. Somebody says, are you Roger Pauley's boy? And they, yes, I am. But on a national level, my dad's name is not famous. And my dad would say to you, he's just a kid that grew up in the mountains of West Virginia and, and tried to work hard and, and do what God had given him to do. 
I remember the year that my dad left business and went full time in the ministry. <laughs> That's, that was a big deal. Nobody, nobody at the church had any idea. Uh, but he was giving more money to the church than they were going to pay him when he went there as pastor. You talk about a switch. And I never saw him any happier. <laughs> Just in love with Jesus, loving people to Jesus. Talked to him the other day. He had led a man to the Lord. And I just thought, that's what I want. That's what I want. Could I just say something to some of you that have been on the, on the trail a little while? Don't you die before you die. And don't you quit before God's finished with you. If you're still breathing, you're not done. Your stewardship's not over. And you know what God wants from start to finish? Don't you coast in to glory. Don't you shift in into neutral and roll across the threshold of heaven. You ought to finish with the pedal to the metal. That's what you ought to do. And make up your mind tonight, by the grace of God, I'm going to be faithful until I see Jesus face to face. This is the great thing that God blesses. The proverb says most men, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find, wouldn't you like to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and what? faithful servant. Wouldn't you like to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith, then determine right now you're going to be faithful till you see Jesus. To let all the results come into heaven's accounting office. You're going to be a faithful steward. And you might feel like your assignment is small. The assignment's up to God. Whatever God assigns you, take that and do the very best you can with it and believe God has his eye on you and the one thing he wants is faithfulness. Let me give you another. Number four, come down to verse three. But with me, he says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Do you see what he just said in verse 3 and verse 4? He just said, I'm not going to be judged by you, and I'm not even going to judge myself. Now, that's fascinating. How many of you are with me? You don't want somebody else judging you. Isn't that right? Well, hold on to your seat. A spiritual man says, not only can somebody else not see my heart, I don't even know my heart. <laughs> you want to know how wicked your heart is? You can dress it up for church. It can carry the right Bible and sing the hymns and everything. But the heart is still deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the Bible says, I, the Lord, try the heart. Remember, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So the only person who's worthy of judging our stewardship, look at the end of verse number 4, is the Lord. Look at verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. What time? Until the Lord comes who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Could I give you a fourth accounting principle? This is, this is the Lord's accounting principle. Number one, well, as your stewards are the greatest thing in the world, that's truth. Number two, stewardship and ministry always connected. Number three, faithfulness more important than giftedness. Number four, do what you do for the praise of God, not the pleasure of man. It's not for people. It's not to be seen and applauded. It's not even to feel good about yourself. It's not to soothe your own conscience or check a box. That's not what it is. It's for the Lord. In fact, turn over to Colossians 3 with me just for a second. We'll come right back. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3 real quick. Look at what the Apostle Paul wrote to another church about this. Colossians 3, verse number 22. He's talking to servants. He's talking to people literally that were, that were having to work like slaves. And he says to him, Colossians 3, verse 22, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing, verse 24, that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. What should be the great aim? May I give you two things? Write this down. God's purpose and God's glory. That's it. We don't serve for men. We serve for Jesus. For his purpose, that means whatever he wants done, and for his glory. 
I don't want to please men. Now, I do want to please people. And so do you. Tell you a little secret about myself. I like people. How many of you like people most of the time? Yes? And don't we like to be liked by people and we want people to say you did a good job? Sure, we all have that in us. I'm going to tell you what you got to do. You got to die to that. You got to die to you. You got to die to them. You got to die to self. You got to die to criticism and compliments. And you've got to live for an audience of one, and that is Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Would you use a little sanctified imagination for a moment? What would happen tonight if everything here in an instant just receded? I mean, everything you see is gone. Everybody around you is gone. Time stops. And at that instant, you are standing face to face with Jesus. I don't think you'd be standing long. Now we're on our face. Look at his nail-pierced feet. May I ask you, what would you say? What would he say? Here's a better question. What would you like him to say? May I tell you, it's only when we start living with that in mind that what we do every day truly counts for eternity. See, here's the thing. Men can see what you do, but only the Lord knows why you do it. Motive matters. And the Lord, look at verse number 5. The Lord is going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness. The Lord is going to make manifest the counsel of the heart. The Lord who is going to give the real praise on that day, only the Lord knows the motive of your heart. This is sobering to me. Let me just, look, I'm not even going to talk to you for a second. Let me, let me talk to me for a minute and you listen. Scott, do you understand you could travel every week of your life and preach sermons every day of your life and get to heaven and it count for nothing at the judgment seat? God will bless his word and bring people to Christ and accomplish his purposes, but do you understand that when it comes to my service, it could all be counted nothing in the presence of a holy God if I did it for me or for you and not for him. Look, this is something I grapple with as a preacher. You know, when you come into churches every week of your life, every meeting's different, every emphasis is different, but, you know, you want to do well and, and you want to preach a good sermon and you want to be help. And I'm going to tell you what I'm having to do every week right now, die. Just die. That's hard. Flesh dies hard. Crazy living sacrifice just keeps crawling off the altar. And you got to grab it with a sword of the spirit and <clears throat> drag it kicking and screaming back on the altar and say, you're a dead man. Did you know that I have to come to the place where I don't, I don't have to preach a good sermon tonight? I don't have to please you. Nobody in this room has to say to me when it's done, Oh, that was a blessing. Mm -mm. Here's what I got to know. When I lay my head on my pillow tonight, I got to have a clean conscience and know I did what God told me to do. Not for the pleasure of men, but for the praise of God. And in the end, it's the only thing that matters. We'll pick up right where we're leaving off tonight, but May I just give you this little footnote? Did you know even your gifts and blessings are curses till they're yielded to Jesus? Even the gifts God has graciously given every person in this room, whatever those gifts are, they're curses until you yield them to the Lord. And here's why. They work against you. They work against him. They work for the pleasure of men. They work for the praise of flesh and self they, they lift up me instead of Jesus. And only when they're yielded to God can they be used as God intended. Only then, empowered by the Holy Spirit, do they accomplish that which brings God glory alone. That's why a stewardship conference must be a surrender conference where we wave the white flag to Jesus and say, Lord, all things are from you, all things for our sake. And so all things are going to be given. Back to God. 
I'm praying somehow this week. Look, you've had a lot of stewardship preaching through the years, haven't you? And I'm praying somehow this week there'll be some believers in this room, young and old, men and women, new members and old members, who will say, by the grace of God, I'm going to start accounting the way God accounts so that when I finally get home and meet Jesus, I have something to meet on the other side. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.